the reason why I wanted to make a lecture like this is because really dentistry is hard and not many people realize that. Um, every day we have to treat multiple patients. We have to talk to them, socialize with them, make them feel comfortable. And then simultaneously we have to do treatment and we have to do treatment in their mouth. We work in millimeters and sometimes it gets very difficult. And so I decided to put together a lecture of some of the clinical pearls I've come across over the years of being an oral surgeon. And I wanted to share them all with you tonight. Um, the picture on the right is a that oral surgeons use routinely called Oral Maxillofacial Surgery Secrets. And it, what it is, is it's a book that offers information in just a fact-based format. It gives fact after fact after fact. And after it gives a fact, it then goes over what the research shows, and then it goes over what oral surgeons find or the results they see clinically. And so that's kind of the format I'm going to keep for today as well. And my goal overall is for everyone to pull hopefully one or two pearls out of this lecture that they could use going forward in their practice. So I hope um, everyone enjoys it. And we're going to go into our first statement on whether it is fact or fiction. So the first statement is going to be, we're going to go through some statements about implants and or true teeth or full arch surgery. To follow this section, we're going to do denoalveolar surgery. Um, a lot of these statements are going to be about the true teeth or full arch because there is a lot of myths out there. Um, but a lot of the principles that we're going to discuss do apply to single implants as well. So the first factor fiction is about implant length. So implant length is critical for proper osseointegration and crown implant ratio. So this statement comes up all the time with dentists. We get calls very frequently for denti that dentists ask us to look at their x-rays and they say, you know, Rob, look at this x-ray. This implant is very long, uh, pardon me, is very short and the crown is very long. There is a significant amount of interocclusal distance. Is that detrimental? That's a poor crown to implant ratio. And the answer to that question is this is in fact fiction. What the research shows us, multiple studies have shown that after osseointegration, length no longer matters. All of the stress we find on an implant after osseointegration occurs around the first six millimeters. There's no contribution to stability after that first six millimeters and all the stress is dissipated after that number. So once integrated, an implant, whether it be an eight millimeter implant or a 16 millimeter implant will behave as a six millimeter implant. So although crown to root ratio is very important with natural teeth, crown to implant ratio is actually a myth and is not that important when it comes to osteointegration and restoring our implants. So the follow-up question we get all the time is clinically, why don't you just use six millimeter implants then? Why are you, if that's all you need for a good SU integration, then what's the catch? And the catch is not that biologic stability or SU integration, it's the primary stability or the initial stability, the mechanical stability that we need to place an implant. And the number one reason why an implant will fail is because of lack of appropriate or appropriate primary stability. And on six millimeter implants, that primary stability is sometimes very difficult to come by. And so the research out there shows so many different things on how to figure out whether an implant will go in and have good stability, whether it be CT evaluations, these Hounsfield units people talk about, or the implant structure themselves. You know, they put different chemicals on implants, they uh, manufacture them differently in order to try and aid in the stability. But what I found clinically is it all comes down to the surgeon. The experience of the surgeon will dictate whether you could gain that primary stability or not. And so what I usually say is it's all about that first drill when we do an implant. That first drill for a surgeon will tell them everything, whether they need to underprepare the osteotomy or overprepare the osteotomy. And that is really all comes down to what the surgeon feels and then what they need to do or adjust to get that stability. Many times with old six millimeter implants, we would always tell each other, man, I just needed that one more turn to get that stability. And that was always the issue with these shorter implants. Now the picture on the lower left though is the BLX six millimeter implant. One of the reasons I like that is just the way it's designed. It's because it has a much more aggressive thread pattern than prior six millimeter implants. And they actually made it so the threads are closer together than the other sized implants. So you have more threads on more surface area, which aids in gaining that primary stability. So although the implant length does matter for primary stability, the implant length does not matter after osseointegration. So that's one myth that I wanted to dispel to start. 
So the next thing I wanted to talk about is the virtual surgical planning, which is the webinar that we usually do for these true teeth or full arch surgeries. We typically do them with smile in a box through Strauman, and sometimes we use a company called NSequence. And many times, a lot of people, it's at annoying time in the afternoon after a busy day with patients, and a lot of dentists and even the surgeons say, you know, this is kind of a waste of time. You know, the, the technician doing the webinar will do all the work for us. And I just wanted to bring up that, of course, this is fiction because there is a few things that we can look into when doing these webinars that will help with our restorative goal. And our restorative goal is to get the temporary in on stable implants. And so we need to try to predict getting primary stability in order to get that temporary and from a restorative standpoint. And so the first pearl about the virtual planning is give yourself a bailout. So this is what the virtual plan may look like for one of the implants in a case. And typically the technicians like to put the longest and widest possible implant in the bone. And what we typically say then is that implant would look good per se, but let's go one size smaller in width and length. We then document that. So at the time of surgery, if we put that implant in that's a little bit smaller and we don't gain the primary stability, we then know without having to review the x-ray again or calling the end sequence to ask about if there's enough bone, we know right away that we have a bailout because we can go longer or wider. And so what we actually do on the right side of the screen here, you could see a little mock-up that we write at the time of the webinar. So we write the type of implant, BLX, where the implant positions are going to be, and the size of the implant we selected. And what we write next to that though is, can we go longer or can we go wider? And so on the day of the surgery, we have this in the room. So if we put one of the implants in and the implant doesn't have good primary stability, we know right away without having to stop our surgery that we can go potentially longer or wider or potentially we can't. But the good news from a restorative standpoint is with the BLX system, it's still one restorative platform and one connection. So even if I change the length or width of the implant, the connection at the prosthetic level for the multi-unit abutment stays the same. So it doesn't change any part of the surgery in that regard. It just ensures that we get better stability. The second pearl I wanted to talk about with the virtual planning is using our middle implants as the cornerstone. So I have highlighted here this middle implant in yellow. And from both a restorative and surgical phase, we should always try and remember to put that implant in first. That implant is, quote unquote, our test implant. If that implant goes in with great primary stability, then we could feel confident putting in the posterior implant and anterior implant on that side and knowing we would likely get good stability, which means we could temporize and restore that day. If though we put that middle implant in and we don't get good primary stability and we try and try and try and maybe we end up having to bury that implant, at least we didn't shoot ourselves in the foot because we still have changes we can make to the posterior and anterior implants to ensure we maintain that AP spread and ensure being able to temporize same day. So even for the restorative doctors, it's important sometimes to remind the surgeon when we start placing the implants, maybe we should start with one of the middle implants to ensure we get that primary stability. And the last little pro I like to bring up from the restorative end is the temporary. So usually with these webinars, the technicians like to make a beautiful long span temporary with two premolars and two molars, and it looks beautiful. But ideally in the temporary, we wanna limit any cantilever. Cantilevers are very detrimental in a, in a temporary. And so in this image here of a webinar, you can see the arrow points to this implant where it's coming out in the occlusal of the molar, which shows very little cantilever in its good position. On the contralateral side though, we see that the implant had to be placed a little more anteriorly because of the, the location of the sinus, which resulted in a cantilever. Now, ideally we don't wanna cut this molar off because aesthetically the patient may not be happy with that result. So what we do restoratively is when we get this temporary, we actually hollow out that molar and from an occlusal level and just leave a little buckle shell. So the patient maintains an aesthetic look in the temporary but it's non-functional. So that's just another little pearl that we like to come up with a virtual planning to make our surgery more efficient, but also to make it easier to get to the restorative aspect of things during the surgery. Now, speaking about cantilevers, the next statement or factor fiction is tilted implants are better than parallel implants to reduce the length of a cantilever. Now in the temporary we just discussed, we really shouldn't be having any type of cantilever. 
But in the final prosthesis, we might need to have a cantilever. We might need to extend our prosthesis posteriorly for an aesthetic result or for a functional result. And so this statement is in true fact. Cantilevers are extremely detrimental when it comes to true teeth and full arch surgery. And so the more tilted or angled we can make an implant, the less the cantilever will be. And the less the cantilever would mean the less stress on the distal implants, which means a better success rate. These same principles applies to, apply to our prosthesis. The lower or the less cantilever we have in the prosthesis, the less stress we place on the prosthesis, and the less risk we run of developing issues like fractures um, or bone loss around the implant on the distal aspect. Now the research will show with a 17 degree tilt of the posterior implant versus a 34 degree tilt, your stress reduction gets reduced by 11 or 18% respectively. Now clinically, how does that correlate? I like to talk about two patients. So one would be you know, the older patient who's a little frail, a little medically compromised, occluding on, an, an, on a denture. These changes in percentages in research probably don't com you know, compensate or really matter for that type of patient or correlate, that change in stress reduction. But if we have a 30-year-old football player who we know is going to eat you know, steak and rocks right after surgery, then this reduction in stress because of a more tilted implant at 34 degrees might be beneficial. So these numbers in reducing the length of the cantilever are patient-specific clinically. And the thing we have to remember though too about these cantilevers and about these tilted implants is the success rate we see in a single tooth implant, which is well over 95%, we see the same success rates in these types of surgeries because of cross arch stabilization. So we do like to tilt implants. Um, we do like to minimize the length of the cantilever, but it is vital that these prostheses are cross arch stabilized. That is what brings us to the level of success of a single unit implant. So although we do like tilted implants, we have to remember they have to be splinted cross arch. So the next fact or fiction that I wanted to review is a question we get all the, uh, asked all the time. You need as many implants as possible for a true teeth or full arch surgery. And that's not necessarily the statement we get all the time. The statement we get all the time is what, four or six, right? Everyone always asks, do you do four or do you do six? What does the research show? What do you see clinically? What's the answer? So the answer to this statement is obviously fiction. It's not true. But the real question is four or six, which is better? And so through the research and through doing these cases in our practice, the research shows that the success between four or six is exactly the same. It really, though, depends the success rate on the distribution of your implants. So if the anterior posterior spread is the same, the cantilever length is the same, and both formats are cross arch stabilized, pardon me, then the same success will be seen in four or six implants. So then clinically, what do we do for and when do we do six? And so what I usually come up with is again, it becomes to those two types of patients. In a patient that's a little bit older, maybe a little frail, me medically compromised, maybe including against the denture, maybe it would be smarter to do four because not only will that probably be tolerated well and last, it also is much easier from a dexterity standpoint to clean from the restorative end once we have our final restoration in, it's much easier to clean around four as opposed to six implants. But again, going back to that patient who's a young football player, who's a burly guy, very strong muscles, we may wanna do a little insurance policy and do a fifth and sixth implant in order to help support our prosthesis Although it is a little harder to clean the six implant prosthesis, the younger patient might have a little more manual dexterity. Now that fifth and sixth implant on the two images, you see the two graphs, the yellow graph here, if you could see my cursor, the two yellow, uh, pardon me, red arrows are pointing to the amount of stress on the fifth and sixth implants placed on an all on six case. And you can see compared to the anterior two implants and the posterior two implants, there's very little stress on those implants. And when you compare this graph to the graph to the right in blue, that's the stress on the simple all on four. So even the research shows that adding a fifth and sixth implant really doesn't have much effect on the overall success as long as you meet the same parameters. It's really a patient specific thing from an insurance policy and a cleansability standpoint. And this is a quote actually from Brandemark, pretty much discussing how some clinicians who want to install multiple implants should be questioned. 
So let's talk about our next fact or fiction. So the next one is something that's been, or a statement that's been propagated by a lot of these implant um, clinics where you could go and get, you know, a teeth in a day full arch thing at like a clinic. And they say in their research, individual implant insertion torque does not matter as long as the total insertion torque across all implants is 120. So that's saying if we put in four implants and, you know, five, you know, two of them are 10 milli, you know, 10 Newton centimeter in torque, but the rest are, you know, 50 or 60 that we could still go to the temporary restorative, uh, restorative phase. Now, to me, that was always sound a little bit bogus and a little bit weird because, you know, a five or 10 Newton centimeter stability implant, you know, that's not good stability. And so when looking through everything, that in fact is fiction. There's really no literature, true literature out there that says that that holds true. When it comes down to it, it's all about the individual implant. Each implant needs to be at or above 30 Newton centimeters in order to, for it to be loaded. You know, biomechanically, the reason for that torque value is because that limits micro motion between the implant and bone. And if you limit the micro motion below 100 micrometers, then theoretically the chance of success in an implant falls into that category of above 95%. So although that number of 120 Newton centimeters across the whole prosthesis is, is nice, especially if you're having trouble getting your implants in, it in fact is a myth. The next statement I wanted to go through, and I hope this isn't too rapid fire for Boone, but I thought I would mix it up with this lecture, so I hope people are enjoying it, is you can eat anything after a true teeth or full arch surgery. And now this is a question we get mainly from our patients who come in for their consultations. And it's also a question propagated by the media. You know, these clinics that do these surgeries, um, you know, they show a commercial where a patient walks in an office and then, you know, walks out smiling and, you know, a magical apple appears and they take a bite or a piece of corn on the cob appears and they take a bite and, you know, you could eat whatever you want right after surgery. And we all know that's not true. But the statement here is in true fact. And the reason why I say it's a fact is because I do tell patients that they could eat whatever food they really want to after these types of procedures. It's just that they need to make sure the texture of that food is appropriate. So if a patient enjoys eating apples, that's totally fine. They just have to eat applesauce. Or if they enjoy eating carrots, they just have to steam them and make them a little mushy. And the usual, the parameter that we say in our practice to have patients understand what they can and cannot eat is the side of a fork test. If you could easily cut through a food item with the side of a fork, then it would be fair game for you to eat um, while you heal from your full arch or true teeth surgery. Um, obviously, we have some of the men sit there and say, well, I could, you know, ratchet through, a, you know, a piece of steak. That obviously doesn't count. But as long as the texture is appropriate and you could get through it with the side of a fork, then that is typically the diet we recommend during the healing phase of our true teeth cases. So the other question that we get and in doing the webinars for a few years now and helping run our study club for quite some years now, and we do these lectures, everyone always asks the question to the lecturer, when do you remove the prosthesis? How often do you remove it? And do you need to replace the screws in the prosthesis? What, what do we do? And I'll be honest, after all the lectures I've seen and gone to, it's usually a different answer amongst everybody. But what the actual... Um, this in fact is fact that you do not have to remove it because the American College of Prosthodontics actually released a paper that did say, and I'm going to quote them because it actually is written very nicely, that there is no indication for removal and or replacement of prosthesis or screws if your restoration is in function and are free of mechanical complications. So as long as the prosthesis and implants don't exhibit the signs listed in this slide here, then there's no indication to remove it or to remove the screws and replace them. It also was interesting that they did recommend that you take x-rays or new radiographs every one to two years after final delivery, because that is another question that we get very frequently, or obviously to any sign of issue or complication. So this is a great little article that the American College of Prosthodontics put out on maintaining these full arch or true teeth cases. And um, you know, for the screws and for removal of the prosthesis from a hygiene standpoint, as long as they don't meet any of these criteria, then there's really no indication to have it be removed. So the last fact or fiction before we get into dentoalveolar surgery that I wanted to review is 
anyone could get a true teeth or full arch surgery. Now, we all know that this in true, this in fact is fiction. But after doing these cases now for quite some years and kind of starting with the, you know, the initial analog way of doing it, and now we do it very, more so digitally, our practice and, and us came together and we have uh, four at-risk patients that we came up with. These are patients that we usually get a little weary of when it comes to doing these types of cases. And so the first patient that we get a little weary of is the patient with a full arch of existing dentition. This patient came to us looking to do, you know, a true teeth case on both the maxilla and the mandible. He wanted to start with the maxilla. But these cases get very difficult. And the reason is because they have all their dentition on the maxilla. The roots are long. There's root canal teeth. There's bulbous roots. There's very little bone. And it would be very hard or tricky to get four or six on this gentleman implants in this when we have to take out all these extractions and have all these sockets. And so what we've learned over the years is sometimes with these patients, what we do is we treat them like an immediate denture case, where we actually bring them in first and do a procedure where we remove their posterior teeth first and graft them, allow them to heal for a few months, then work them up for the true teeth case so that we know posteriorly we have the support we need and the bone foundation we would need in order to do the procedure and do it well to get the primary stability. So these are the types of patients, number one, one of the four at-risk patients that we get a little weary of when we see them for consultation. The second one we get very weary of is the high smile line. The severe bone reduction cases, again, with the high smile line, the goal is to bring the transition line between the prosthesis and the gingiva or the bone higher than the smile line so that when you smile, you don't see that line. Restoratively, obviously, after a surgery like this and you go to the recovery room and you ask them to smile, you see that transition line in it and it's, it's just a nightmare. And so from a restorative standpoint, we need to ensure that we could hide that smile line. But some of these patients, like this patient you see here, we have to reduce a ton of bone in order to get enough clearance to hide the smile line. So these patients worry us quite some bit because I'm taking, I believe this was about 17 millimeters of bone in order to make enough room to hide the transition line above the smile line of this patient. And so it was a big conversation with the patient whether she wanted to undergo this because if things do fail or things do not work well, she's not left with much of a maxilla in order to house just a regular complete denture. And so these are patients that we have to be also weary of when we look at these cases. The third and fourth at-risk patients are kind of grouped together. And so the third one would be our young patients. More and more frequently, you know, almost every day, we're seeing patients in their 30s coming in with terminal dentition like this gentleman here and wanting to do you know, an all on four, a true teeth, full arch case. And the issue becomes, you know, they expect these things to last the rest of their lifetime. And it's kind of hard at times discussing with them, you know, you're 30 years old, you haven't even had these teeth for 30 years. You know, you really, I mean, your 12 year molars, you, you really only have had these teeth for 18 years and they're, they're hopeless. And so we get a little weary with our younger patients now when they come in with the hopes of getting these implants and true teeth, you know, cases, because they do sometimes expect them to last for a very long time. And, and overall, they do last for a very long time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say they won't, but it's important for our younger patients to understand that it may not be a lifetime. It may be many, many years, but not necessarily their entire life. And then obviously our fourth patient that we want to be weary of is going to be our medically compromised patients. So we have seen definitely clinically, just like the research says, increased failures in patients with uncontrolled diabetes, significant smoking habits, and more frequently in this day and age, unfortunately, with the opioid crisis, um, drug abusers or prior drug abusers even um, tend to have worse outcomes um, than patients who do not have those medical comorbidities. So those are also things that obviously we still work up and look to try to do these cases. Um, I will say personally, I do tell most patients who smoke that, I, that we won't go through the procedure unless they quit um, smoking. And so far, both of them that have come in have. So it is something and a discussion worth having because we definitely clinically see increase in failures in that type of patient. So what I wanted to do quickly and just check in our time here about 24 minutes in. So what I wanted to do then is trans transition to a little bit of same type of format, but now talk a little bit about dental alveolar surgery. 
So just some routine questions, comments that we get from restoring dentists, um, general dentists, prosthodontists about kind of what we do and how we go about our dental alveolar surgery. And so one of the big things that we hear all the time is, you know, oral surgery, go see the oral surgeon, you know, he has tricks to getting you numb or he knows how to give you Novocaine, you know, better than other people. And the answer to that is we really don't have any tricks. You know, we really don't know anything different than what all of our other colleagues know. But a lot of dentists always ask me, you know, so Rob, what, what do you do? How do you get a tooth numb? So what I figured I would do quickly is just show how I would typically get a upper molar and a lower no molar <clears throat> anesthetized. And so the left-sided picture here is an upper molar. For upper teeth, I typically use se septicane exclusively. And what I typically do to start is I give about three quarters of a carpule up in this green area here in the mucobuccal fold. I guess you can consider it a little posterior to a middle superior alveolar block. I give the rest of the carpule as a quick injection on the palate while holding pressure in the palate with my, the back end of a mirror. After that sets in for about 10 minutes, I take a second carpule of septicane and I do local infiltration at both papilla on the buckle. And then I use the rest of the carpule on the palatal. So usually two carpules of septicane given in that manner. And I would say in a maxillary tooth, 99.9% .9 of the time that tooth is profoundly numb. Now in the mandible, what I typically do is I do a little bit of lidocaine and septicaine. And so this little green dot on the bottom here is just an indication that I start with lidocaine and I actually give two carpules of lidocaine for an extraction as a block. So I give two carpules as an inferior alveolar nerve block with a lingual block. After I let that set in for about 10 or 15 minutes, I then take a carpule of septicaine and I give a little bit of septicaine in the mucobuccal fold. Similar to the maxilla, I give a little bit in both papillas, and then I give another little infiltration on the lingual to get any, if there's any of those accessory nerves to myelohyoid in that area. And I must say in the mandible, that's doing that with three total carpules is, is about 99% effective. If they still are feeling a little bit in that area, then usually turn to doing maybe an intraligamentary injection or an intrapopal injection, but most of the time that, um, you know, that pattern of giving Novocaine and local anesthesia works very well to get profound anesthesia. So the next thing that I wanted to bring up or talk about factor fiction is an atraumatic extraction is important to maintain appropriate bone quality for a future implant. Now that does make perfect sense. And that is why in fact, it is a fact that is true, but I just don't love the word atraumatic. You know, to, you know, I just feel like an extraction inherently is traumatic, whether it be from an emotional standpoint or a physical standpoint, it is inducing some trauma. And so the word I like to use instead is twofold, either sectioning in a sectioning extraction or a preserving extraction. So the goal of our extraction is yes, to be atraumatic, but that really means we want to use the technique of sectioning teeth and we want to use the technique of preserving as much structure as we can in order to keep things, uh, the local anatomy and architecture intact. And so the whole goal with, you know, a sectioning, uh, sectioning a tooth and preserving things is to preserve our buccal plate. That's our goal with an extraction. And ideally we want to avoid flap elevation at all costs. Cause as we know, the buccal gingiva offers a significant amount of blood supply to the buccal plate, which helps prevent resorption of the buccal plate if we could keep it intact. And so, Typically for most teeth and on this picture here, we could see any tooth in the maxilla or mandible can be sectioned, even a central. You could section it north or south, east or west, canines, premolars, even the lateral you could section. And molars, obviously we like to section into individual roots, but the whole goal with our extraction is to section the tooth as many times as needed to get the tooth out without interfering with the buccal plate without having to elevate a flap. And I would say nowadays, pretty much about 98% of the extractions we do, we do without ever having to elevate a flap or without ever having to trough or remove the buccal bone. And so sectioning and preserving is very important. The picture on the right here is an intraoral picture I took last week, a tooth where we did uh, remove the crown on a tooth that had recurrent decay. And then we sectioned it. So you could see we sectioned it similar to the picture. We have a mesial buccal root, a distal buccal root, and our palatal root here. We took each root out separately and we preserved our buccal gingiva and the buccal plate. And that's really the way that we should go about trying to take out teeth um, in this day and age. You know, uh, you know, I know the term is atraumatic, but 
I just am not terribly in love with that word overall. So the next thing is talking about extractions is oral surgeons have special insurance that they use to help take out teeth or to help extract teeth. And fact or fiction on that, it isn't true a fact. Now, we do have special instruments without a doubt, but these instruments are available to everybody. So I'm actually gonna go through a few instruments that we use on a daily basis to help take out teeth and root tips. And again, they're available, you know, with everyone, you know, I'm gonna go through what companies make them and, and, how they're, and how they're used. And so going from left to right here, the first instrument we have here is what's called a serrated root forcep. And so what this is, it's similar to a rongeur, but the beak is much longer and it gets much thinner at its end and it's serrated. So this works perfectly when you have a little root tip remaining and it's mobile, but you just don't have that instrument to grasp that tip to get it out. And it's not mobile enough that it will just kind of elevate out. This little instrument here has thin beaks that will let you kind of get right around the PDL and grab that little root tip to remove it. So this is something we use very frequently with wisdom teeth, but we use on regular teeth as well very frequently. The next two instruments are instruments we use routinely almost on every surgery. And these are called root approximators. These are made by Carl Schumacher, um, a company that makes very, very, very nice um, oral surgical instruments. And so what they are similar to is a peritome. So there's one that has a spade-like end and one has more of like a flat or beveled end. And these instruments work fantastic to get roots out. What you do is you use them to shimmy through the PDL between the root and the bone. And as you shimmy, it's a very, very thin edge. It starts to release and luxate that root tip, which allows you to deliver it much easier. Uh, these are, you know, very commonplace in our daily oral surgical procedures. Next to the two root approximators, I have what appears to be an upper universal forcep, maxillary forcep, but it actually is a pediatric maxillary universal. The reason why I put it on here is because the beaks of the pediatric maxillary forcep are smaller than a traditional maxillary universal. And the good thing about that is when you're trying to take out an anterior tooth and you keep rotating on the tooth because the beaks are too large, this instrument here gives you a better a, a grip or it gets to hold of the tooth much better and works better with some of the anterior extractions. The second to last here on the right is what's called the gold handle. That's the literal name in the catalog of this forcep. It's very similar to a maxillary universal forcep and it's made by Carl Schumacher. And the good thing about this is the beaks are thinned but the beaks are also pleated in a diamond coating similar to the diamond burrs we use. So it's almost like the beaks have sandpaper on them. So if you have that premolar where the crown came out in the post and you have a little bit of tooth structure that you wanna try and grab, but every time you use a regular forcep, it just rocks off or rotates off, this instrument works wonders in getting good grip of the tooth and, and luxating and delivering it. And lastly, the instrument here that looks similar to a cow horn, I have it another view on the bottom right, this is a mandibular number 17 forcep. In our office, we actually call it a Bergie because um, one of the founders of our practice, Dr. Berg, used this instrument routinely, and now we all use it routinely. It behaves very similar to a cow horn, but you can see the pointed beak is a little less severe than a traditional cow horn. And this engages the furcation of a first or second molar and allows you to use almost like a pumping action, like a well, in order to luxate the tooth. And we find that this type of forcep actually works better than a cow horn because a cow horn traditionally, when you start to try and you know, pump the tooth like a well with the cow horn to get into the furcation, what inevitably usually happens, the tooth fractures in half. And we find with this forcep here, it's much easier to luxate the tooth without it fracturing and removing it in one piece. So that was a little bit on one of some of the little tricks that we use with our instruments. So the another, next thing that we talk about very frequently is most extractions should be grafted. You know, we talk all the time with our restorative colleagues about extractions and it's a four wall defect. Should you graft, you know, I may do a bridge and not an implant, should we graft? And what I would say in looking at both the literature and looking at what we see clinically is I do agree with this, that we in fact should think about grafting most extraction sockets. And my theory or my reasoning is no matter what we do and whatever we put in as a filler in a socket, there will always be some degree of horizontal bone loss. You could liken it to this extraction socket on the right side here. This is a maxillary anterior tooth and we know how the buccal plate is always so much thinner than the robust lingual plate. And inevitably when we take out this tooth, there is gonna be some resorption both in a horizontal and vertical manner in that area. 
And so what the research really shows in the, both the Amos consensus statement across some of the perio literature as well, is that if we graph the site, we usually preserve about one to two millimeters more of the buccal bone than if we don't graft. Now, many people say one to two millimeters isn't much of anything, but when we think from a restorative standpoint about the um, emergence profile of our implant and crown, and when we think about an anatomical consideration like the sinus or the nerve, one or two millimeters might be helpful. And recently, with a lot of teeth, we actually, even if the patient was deciding to do a bridge, a lot of the doctors that we've been working with have still recommended that we graft an extraction socket even for a bridge in the future to maintain the architecture of the alveolar bone to allow the gingiva to heal in a more anatomic location and prevent kind of that cupping underneath the pontic of the bridge, which becomes a hygiene issue. And one of the other examples we find when we do bridges or hear of patients doing bridges, and again, I'm not knocking bridges, bridges work very well and last very long. This was a patient where we had to extract tooth number 21 and the restoring dentist wanted to restore with a five unit bridge to the canine, which was a perfectly okay treatment plan. Unfortunately though, this bridge, this three unit bridge, when the dentist went to remove it, the crown of tooth number 20 fractured within the bridge. And so I got a call and, and he said, you know, Rob, we got to take out tooth number 20 now and we do have to look to do implants. So we were fortunate enough that we did graft the 21 site to preserve the architecture, but sometimes it is in fact a good insurance policy, even if we are gonna do bridge work to in fact bone graft that area. So I wanted to transition towards the end of the lecture here to a few things that we got a few more minutes here uh, about medications. So as oral surgeons, we get calls every day from many different doctors, whether, you know, do medications need to be stopped? Do medications need to be held? Do we need to pre-medicate? What's the newest stuff say? So I'm going to go through a few medications and what the most recent stuff is saying. And the first thing is about blood thinners. So, you know, the statement says you do not need to stop blood thinners prior to an extraction. So that in fact is fiction. But what I like to do is put up this diagram or this table, and I know it might be small and hard to read, but this was put out by uh, the American Association of Oral Surgeons in their Parameters of Care, which was pretty much a publication that kind of summarizes a lot of issues that we run into every day. And this pretty much lists a lot of the most common blood thinners we run into. We have Coumadin in here, Zarelto, Eliquis, we have Plavix on this side, and it kind of discusses whether you need to discontinue that medication or not. Now, one thing, this is all based on research. One thing I wanted to bring up, though, from a clinical side of things is the Xarelto and Eliquis. Although here it does say in the research that you really don't need to stop it depending on the amount of teeth you take out. So if you're taking out one tooth, you really don't need to discontinue it. I will say clinically, we do find that patients bleed on these. Not, not all of them, but some of them do. And when they do bleed and they didn't stop their medication, it makes it much harder to stop the bleeding. So although the research might say for one tooth, you may not need to stop it, but for two or three, you should. I usually recommend even to this day to talk to the cardiologist about holding it. If the cardiologist says they can hold it, then fantastic. They hold it for two days or three days and you feel a little more safe taking out the tooth. But clinically, sometimes the cardiologist says you can't stop it. And so if, what do you do then? And so what we usually do now is if the patient can't stop their blood thinner like Xarelto or Eliquis and they take it in the morning, we want to wait at least six hours before we then extract the tooth. Giving six hours reduces that initial serum concentration or bump a little bit, which will help us. Ideally, you do not want to take out a tooth you know, at 8 a.m. after on the way to the office, your patient took their Eliquis in the morning. That's not ideal. Um, we want to try and push that off if we have to. So that's one thing I wanted to just talk about with the blood thinners. Again, this is a great little chart and Plavix on here. Some of the more newer ones like Effian, and uh, this is a uh, brand name of Berlinta. Um, so it's a very good little chart there. So the other medication is a little pre-medication, and that is you do not need to pre-medicate for a hip or knee replacement. And now the fact or fiction answer to this is that is in true fact. Both of these conclusion statements do say that there is no need to pre-medicate for a prosthetic joint anymore because the research that they found actually shows that the risk of taking an antibiotic is greater than the actual risk of getting a prosthetic joint infection. And so they recommend both the conclusion on the right is from the ADA, says that you do not need to do it. The conclusion on the left is actually from Amos that, that quotes the ADA saying you do not need to. 
And so we do not no longer we do no longer need to premedicate for joint replacement. But inevitably, clinically, what do we see? We see that patient who comes in for the last 20 years, they premedicate and they say, that's great, doc. I'm glad that you don't want me to premedicate, but I'm premedicating. You know, it doesn't matter. I do it every time. And so what they recommend is that you speak or you have the patient speak with the orthopedic surgeon. And inevitably what happens, it was 20 years ago and the orthopedic surgeon isn't around anymore or retired. So then what do you do? And what I'd say clinically, if the patient's going to push you that hard, two grams, four pills of amoxicillin before an extraction is probably not going to do much in long term. So if they give you a hard time clinically, you know, probably still would end up giving it to them because it actually is probably beneficial to prevent infection after the extraction. But ideally, in this day and age, we don't need to do that. The next statement would be clindamycin is a good alternative to penicillin and penicillin allergic patients. There's a lot of new stuff coming out about clindamycin. And is it clindamycin a good antibiotic or not? And in fact, it is coming out that clindamycin is not a good alternative to penicillin. And the reason being is there's a lot of evidence now that there is not a good effect at all in any denoalveolar surgery of preventing infection with clindamycin. And actually one of the uh, true teeth or uh, one of the clinics out there, I forget which one that does full arch surgery like teeth in a day in and out, they actually conducted their own research within their facility on failures and they actually came out with an answer that said that they saw more failures in patients who were given clindamycin prosurgically as opposed to amoxicillin. Now, granted, that is not the best of research, just not you know, a double blind study, but it's something to think about. The other thing too, from a surgical standpoint of us in the hospital, when we run cultures and sensitivities on bad infections in the head and neck that we do in the operating room, most always they come back as resistant to clindamycin or the clindamycin has no effect on the infection. And then obviously, lastly, everyone knows that the side effect of pro profile of clindamycin isn't great. You know, we always get those phone calls after work about, you know, GI upset, diarrhea, God forbid the C. diff colitis. And so in this day and age, a lot of people are starting to recommend to go to either azithromycin, a Z-pack, go back to the old school doxycycline, which was given for perio infections, or for even bigger infections, now people are starting to give these fluoroquinolones like Levaquin, Levaquin or Cipro. Even the AHA or the American Heart Association recently in 2021 revised their antibiotic regimen for dental procedures or for prophylactic antibiotics before dental procedures for heart patients. So although we don't premedicate anymore for knee and, and hip replacements, we still absolutely premedicate for the patients that meet the criteria for infective endocarditis. But interestingly enough, in 2021, they took off clindamycin. You can see at the bottom of the chart, clindamycin is no longer recommend recommended for antibiotic prophylaxis. And they actually replaced it with azithromycin, clorithromycin, and doxycycline. So even the American Heart Association has taken clindamycin out of the ballgame. So getting into our last couple of slides, and I'll go through one. I'm sure everyone's getting a little tired. Um, there's no medication to aid in inflammation, graft healing, or implant healing. And this is something we get all the time with our patients when we talk about healing for three or four months after a bone graft or an implant. They always ask, well, doc, what can I do to make it heal better? Should I take calcium or vitamin D or drink more milk? And the answer is that there's not really an answer to those things. They're good to take, they're healthy, but this is in fact fiction. There actually is a medication that we could think about giving that will help with inflammation. And that medication is called periostat. Many of you know Peristat is low-dose doxycycline or doxycycline given at 20 milligrams twice a day. The good thing about the doxycycline given at 20 milligrams twice a day is it doesn't behave at all as an antibiotic. It actually behaves as an anti-inflammatory. It reduces the inflammatory markers that cause destruction of the bone around teeth like periodontis, periodontitis or periimplantitis around an implant. And this drug has been shown to reduce these cytokines and enzymes that destroy or, or lead to bone loss around teeth and implants. And by reducing that, it makes our implants and teeth last longer. It gives a more predictive result. It also allows the gingiva to heal better. And so although the research is there, I must say putting many patients on this over the years, especially patients with medical comorbidities, they heal very, very, very well when they're on this drug. And interestingly enough, this periostat, this drug has been likened to not only local inflammation in our mouths, but it has been likened to systemic inflammation in treating many different types of disease processes in our body. 
whether it be diabetes, whether it be heart disease or kidney disease, it was actually published in the, you know, in JADA. And when an interesting topic is many hospitals now are actually using doxycycline, low dose doxycycline or doxycycline on its own to treat COVID because the cytokine storm that everyone gets worried about and that is the part of the site of the treatment process that can lead to death has been shown to have the same cytokines that doxycycline at low dose inhibits. And so many hospitals are starting to catch on to if we could reduce with a simple drug like doxycycline, the cytokines that lead to the cytokine storm, this might be a very easy treatment for COVID. And so that's something that's really starting to take, uh, take, uh, you know, take hold and grasp. And hopefully there's more out there because it's a very easy drug to administer. So the last couple of medications is Decadron or dexamethasone, which is a local steroid. Is it, can it be administered to aid in post-operative pain and swelling? Because in this day and age with you know, the opioid epidemic and issues with you know, narcotics and prescribing them and pharmacies and issues, we wanna do whatever we can to try and reduce post-operative pain and swelling. And in fact, giving Decadron locally can be a great adjunct to help with post-operative pain and swelling. And so what we typically do after a tough extraction is we administer between two and four milligrams of dexamethasone or decadron into the mucobuccal fold or submucosally around the tooth or even intramuscularly in the mandible. And we have found clinically that patients bounce back so quick and so much faster when we do this, they actually end up not needing any narcotic or if they do need narcotic, it's a very low dose of narcotic. And so we found that using this really has helped as an adjunct going forward. Now, the last two things I just want to talk about quickly as two anecdotes are more denoalveolar um, medical legal considerations. So blood pressure should be taken in patients who, are, um, who have comorbidities or complex medical histories. And obviously, we know the answer is yes. And in fact, to be honest, we all should probably be taking blood pressures on any patient that we do treat in our office for anything. Now, the issue really becomes, you know, what can happen in the office? Now, there are some medical legal, you know, statements out there that, you know, a patient was given local anesthesia, usually with epinephrine, and their blood pressure spiked, and they had a stroke or an MI, and now there's an issue. And so, although that did happen, looking through all those um, statements and all those filings, most likely, and unfortunately, it was just a coincidental event, and honestly, very bad luck that day for that dentist. But if you had a blood pressure before you started that treatment in that patient, that may help you, you know, or may have help, helped you stop. Because so many times we see every day a patient comes in for the treatment, right? And you say, well, you took your medication this morning. And what do they always say? Oh, no, I didn't take my blood pressure pill. And, you know, it kills us. You know, why didn't you take it? And, you know, they didn't think they had to. And this graph here actually shows the most recent AHA or American Heart Association parameters for blood pressure. And most recently, as we can see here, normal blood pressure now is considered less than 120 over 80, which is very interesting. Lastly, the last topic I just wanted to go through quickly is our defibrillators. So I know we all legally need to have them in our offices. They get annoying, you know, the batteries die, they start chirping at us like a, fire, a smoke detector and we have to replace the batteries. And, you know, a lot of people say, why do I need this? This is a waste of time. And I don't believe it's a waste of time because although your patient may never need to have it when you're treating them, it usually, like the blood pressure issue, is a coincidental event that that day, unfortunately, in your office, a patient's going to need it. And I must say that defibrillation and learning basic life support, which I know every two years everyone says, you know, this is a hassle, I got to go to this course, it's annoying. It truly can save someone's life. And that's why I have this picture here. This is a picture of my Uncle John. This is at his daughter, my cousin Amory's wedding. He actually learned to play the guitar, to play a song for her at the wedding. It was a great night. Unfortunately, the next morning, my aunt, his wife, woke up to him being unresponsive. She happens to be an NP uh, at St. Francis Hospital, which is the cardiac hospital. She recognized that, she that he was unresponsive. She then recognized he didn't have a heartbeat. She immediately started CPR, literally the day after their daughter's wedding, in the hotel. Called 911 on her cell phone, on speakerphone. The paramedics were able to get there within minutes, thank God. They put the defibrillator on, and as they were going to the ambulance, it said that there was a shockable rhythm. They gave a shock from the defibrillator and shocked him back into normal sinus rhythm. Fortunately, after you know a bunch of a little bit of time in the hospital, though, he was discharged with his full full health back to pretty much normal. He did have a little memory loss from 
and the events that happened that day, but overall he's back to 100%. And it was all because of early defibrillation. Now, I hope none of us ever have to be in this situation, but having that defibrillator in our office is just a great little thing, insurance policy for that coincidental event for that one unlucky day when we need it. So although we hate having to go to the, you know, the basic life support classes, it is very important. It could really help save a life. And with that, I'd be happy if anyone has any questions. I hope that wasn't too rapid fire for you, but I figured I would mix things up tonight and kind of give a potpourri of a little bit of everything. Um, if anyone does have any questions or wants to shoot me an email, this is my email. I'd be happy to have any, anyone email me. And um, I thank you all for joining and I hope everyone gained a couple of pearls out of that lecture. What bone filler or grafting material do you use or prefer? So lately, uh, most recently in the last few, you know, last five years, we've been using a, a cortical cancellous allograft, which would be cadaveric bone. Um, we have found that that transitions very nicely as a scaffolding to allow the patient's own bone to grow in and become the patient's own bone. They used to use a lot of that bovine bone or xenograft. And what you find is, is after four or even six months, when you open that site back up, what you see is xenograft. You don't see much regular bone forming in that area because the xenograft sticks around a lot longer. And so we, you know, this it, more recently and exclusively now, we are using a cortical cancellous allograft. Uh, and and uh, we, we basically now are using both a Stroman allograft and an ACE allograft. So then they both work very well. How oh, many patients on? <laughs> So typically for the low dose doxycycline um, fat post grafting or post implant, I leave them on post implant until after restoration. And if there is any sign of any type of bone loss, I do keep them on for about three to six more months after restoration. I discuss with them that this again does not behave at all as an antibiotic. It will not act as any or lead to any type of antibiotic resistance. The side effect profile is none. I've never really had a patient have an issue with it. And so I do keep them on it for the duration of the graft healing, the duration of the implant healing. And then at that point, I assess whether I'd like to keep them on it or take them back off it at that point. Do you use Periosat for peri-implantitis? Yes, yeah, so um, I, I do, because when you look at how to treat peri-implantitis, you know, there's mechanical and chemical, right? So the mechanical is open it up, debride it out, debride it out, clean everything out, um, scale everything using, you know, implant scalers or the chemical, right? Flush it with something, whether it be some sort of chemical or Paradex or even normal, sa uh, normal saline. Um, there's a lot of different things, but nothing really shows that it truly helps peri-implantitis. And the goal really, what I find with peri-implantitis is even if you graft around that defect, defect in the implant, that grafted bone will never osteointegrate back with the implant. It might make your post-operative x-ray look amazing because you just gained all this bone in a bone graft, but that bone just sh surely serves as a filler and it helps keep that area looking good, but it doesn't lead to more osseointegration. So the goal really in treating peri-implantitis in my view is to stabilize the bone loss or prevent it from getting worse. And I do see when we see patients with peri-implantitis putting them on periostat, although it won't grow any bone back, it does stabilize that bone loss and help maintain that area going forward. And we end up being able to keep a lot of implants that we other, otherwise would have had to take out.